Good morning to you all and um, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be part of this program and I would like uh, to start by apologizing for not having been able to join you in person. Nonetheless, I'm hopeful that this means of communication will enable me to deliver uh, this presentation, which aims to highlight the importance of food consumption information in the way food decisions are made, and particularly when they are based on uh, risk assessments. Uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going to attempt to position exposure assessment in the context of risk analysis and use an example to showcase the importance of food consumption data and particularly food consumption data that is reflective of a particular country or of a particular geography and how that, even through a very simple example, may impact food risk management decisions. Now, of course, uh, to uh, be able to position uh, the way risk assessments are being done, it's very important to uh, refer to the risk analysis paradigm, which is essentially the logical framework that supports food risk decision making or food decision making overall when those decisions pertain to food safety and nutrition. In fact, the reliance on the risk analysis paradigm as the logical uh, decision-making framework was advocated by the FAO and WHO, uh, the FAO and WHO through their joint food standards program and particularly through the Codex Alimentarius Commission. When uh, uh, guidance was issued by Codex uh, for food control systems, this guidance encompassed directions to uh, rely upon a robust legislative and regulatory framework uh, but also insisted that decisions needed to be made according to the three elements of the risk analysis paradigm, risk assessment, risk management, and risk communication, and that, uh, of course, all this system had to be held together with the level of collaboration that is needed between partners and stakeholders, but also with the appropriate governance. Uh, it is also important to rely upon functioning institutions and to have the relevant scientific capacity given that risk assessment is a scientific activity. Now, uh, beyond Codex, uh, the SPS agreement of the World Trade Organization uh, was also uh, a key um, agreement that um, pushed and propelled the requirement to rely on risk analysis and on risk assessment, particularly when food safety related decisions are made. And Article 5 of the SPS agreement is very clear, calling on members that uh, when they develop sanitary measures uh, related to uh, risks associated with human health, and that is the case definitely for food safety, that these measures need to be based on a scientific assessment that relies upon the available scientific evidence. Also, the SPS agreement uh, gave direction as to how risk management measures are to be set and called on members to consider in uh, making their decisions that the decision for risk management needs to be, of course, commensurate to the risk, so justified by the risk, but also it needs to take into account an objective, and that is to minimize negative trade impacts. And in that regard, basically, members should avoid arbitrary or unjustifiable decisions. In this particular case, relying on a systematic approach uh, represented by a logical framework that is the risk analysis framework is certainly a way to uh, comply with the requirements of the SPS agreement. The, the definition of uh, food risk analysis was adopted as follows. Uh, it is in fact an iterative uh, and highly interactive process that needs to be followed by decision makers, particularly by food regulators, when they are addressing food safety and uh, nutrition issues. Uh, the anchor of this needs to be risk assessment. So this is the scientific assessment, but also the two other components that are risk management and risk communication. Now, international organizations, particularly FAO and WHO, have developed uh, a number of expert advice to help countries 
and to help uh, the various food competent authorities rely upon robust risk assessments uh, that support their decision making framework. And the question that is being asked now is when we have such advice, let's say advice provided by JECFA, is it enough? And should we take that advice as is, or are there aspects that need to be looked at and need to be potentially adjusted because they may vary country by country? And the answer is yes, there are aspects that need to be looked at and that need to be adjusted. The areas that tend to be similar or the same to all countries are essentially areas related to hazard identification and characterization. The hazard will likely be the same no matter what the uh, location of its occurrence. So um, even if there are genetic differences in populations, generally those are taken into account in the way hazard characterization studies are conducted through those expert advice. What is different is the exposure assessment. The exposure assessment is generally the result of two elements. First of all, the occurrence of the hazard in the food. And such occurrence, and if we take the example of chemical contaminants, for example, such occurrence will be highly dependent on uh, the way foods are produced, the way uh, the environment is polluted or not, the way methods of production are applied, uh, the way methods of processing are also uh, uh, applied. So all that may influence the way chemical contaminants may occur in food products. The second element that may have an uh, influence uh, on exposure is the way foods are consumed. At the end of the day, exposure is in fact a product of the occurrence of the hazard multiplied by the consumption of the food. And the consumption of the food may be different from one society to the other. We know that food is a, uh, and food consumption is a societal activity, and therefore our dietary habits will be very much influenced by our culture, uh, by our background, by our societies, by our family habits as well, and all that may have an influence on the amount and the quality or the type of products that we consume. Therefore, these two aspects will have an influence on the way exposure is to be assessed. This brings us uh, already to highlight the importance of collecting food consumption information. Because having food consumption information will be a key element that would allow us to make a risk assessment more reflective of a situation that is happening in a particular country or in a particular region. And in fact, uh, there was uh, uh, quite a bit of emphasis on the development of a number of surveys to collect reliable and representative data uh, for this uh, food consumption in different population. The data to be collected should enable to qualify the type of foods consumed in a given area by a given population or subpopulation. It's important to identify the type of food products, their ingredients, the method of preparation, the quantities, in general, it is very much preferred to adopt collection techniques that are individual-based methods, so trying to get the information from a sample of individuals as opposed to relying on household-based approaches. The studies should help us capture differences in consumption patterns, particularly differences in age or differences in gender. Generally, that will help us also identify some patterns related to vulnerable populations such as infants or children, as well as elderly populations. It's also important to uh, be able to highlight any differences that may happen as a result of uh, the society, urban versus rural, any type of cultural differences. And there was a call to the extent possible to standardize the approaches for the collection of this information. And an example of standardization is the EU menu methodology, which is a method that was adopted by the European Union to help it uh, better uh, qualify the uh, consumption patterns and therefore actually help, uh, help the European Food Safety Authority assess the estimates essentially of, of uh, contaminants intake, of intake of, of contaminant or exposure to contaminants. 
The EU menu methodology recommends the use of uh, a food diary study for children. For adolescents and adults, the approach that is uh, recommended is to use what we call a 24-hour recall. So this is essentially an approach where uh, there is an interview of individuals using uh, or not a software, so it can be facilitated by dietary survey software, and essentially there is an opportunity to enter data uh, for what was consumed over a period of a 24 hour. Uh, this needs to be repeated and spaced in time for the repetition such that we can actually capture different patterns of consumption. And the data that is collected should include details on uh, the foods, the beverages, even actually on the supplements uh, that are consumed. Uh, it should capture the recipes, it should capture the, uh, capture the portions that are consumed, any type of methods of processing and preparation, the place of consumption, the time of consumption if required. Now I'm going to try through an example to illustrate uh, the importance of relying on consumption information to obtain data that is reflective of a situation for a given country. I'm going to use a very simple example and an attempt essentially to address an international incident uh, that happened in 2008 and that is the melamine incident. You probably remember this incident. It was a widespread contamination incident where um, milk collection centers witnessed a major fraud by diluting milk uh, with water and introducing to replace that dilution introducing a chemical known as melamine. Melamine is a high nitrogen containing chemical. The reason why it was used is essentially that uh, the quality control method that was used in order to measure uh, whether the milk was um, you know pure or was containing enough protein it was a protein uh, measure system that was relying on nitrogen measurement. It was the Keldal method, uh, uh, sort of a 19th century, actually, uh, method that was used. Well, fraudsters used that and tried to, uh, to a certain extent, uh, actually counter the reliance on this method. And because they uh, supplemented what they diluted uh, with melamine with the high nitrogen containing chemical, they were able to get away at least early on with this particular fraud. Now, uh, this incident was tragic in the sense that uh, the levels of melamine that were added uh, were actually high. And given that milk is a critical ingredient that enters in the composition of so many foods, and in particular food destined to children and infant, and more specifically infant formula, well, infants were impacted because they were consuming high amounts of this particular food product. And we witnessed fatalities in China in this regard. The world mobilized uh, in order to address this issue, and FAO and WHO held an expert consultation in December 2008. This expert consultation led to guidance on the way risks are to be assessed for melamine in food. Now, in this guidance, there was good enough information on the hazard characterization and in fact the guidance resulted in adopting a tolerable daily intake a tolerable daily intake that was identified for melamine as 0.2 milligram per kilogram body weight per day now even though uh, this expert consultation contained exposure assessments using different data coming from different parts of the world when we are to use this information for our own local or national risk management purposes, we need to adopt our own uh, consumption information. And I'm going to try to showcase uh, in the upcoming example an illustration of the importance of relying on accurate and reflective numbers. One of the questions that, were, uh, uh, that was facing regulators was essentially to know what is the level of cutoff that we can impose that would help us distinguish between infant formula that contained melamine as a result of environmental contamination. Melamine can be actually almost between brackets naturally presence, present in, uh, in, uh, in infant formula as a result of environmental contamination with melamine, but also uh, to be able to distinguish this presence from the deliberate presence. In this case, we took hypothetical levels and we took the hypothetical level of one 
2.5 and 20 ppm as cutoff levels, and we try to estimate the intake of melamine using worst case scenarios where the infant formula was entirely contaminated at the levels of 1, 2.5, and 20. The idea by doing so is we're trying to see if we have the worst case scenario, are we having a potential health impact? So, of course, in this case, we needed to have information from different age groups. We needed to have the body weights and we needed to have the consumption information uh, of infant formula for the different age groups. So let's look at what the results would look like if we take different countries that are applying this using different uh, consumption information. So let's take country A, where essentially this estimate was attempted, and country A had consumption information for uh, a subset of the population that we're interested in. It's essentially the four to seven year olds. And we tried to estimate when melamine was present at the level of one ppm, so that's one microgram of melamine per gram of infant formula, and for those four to seven months old babies, if we have a consumption data that is using 900 grams per day, uh, essentially this is the amount that the consumption information uh, and the consumption survey gave us, and if we have a body weight of 7.2, how much of an intake of melamine would we have with this hypothetical level of uh, 1 ppm? The calculation led to a 0.125, essentially, um, milligram per kilogram body weight per day. Now, let's see what happens for country B. For a country B where the consumption information has a significantly higher amount of infant formula consumed per day, and this is the case of uh, a country where you have 1,500 grams per day consumed and a body weight of 7 kilograms. Now, using the same level, cut off 1 ppm of uh, a 1 uh, microgram of melamine per gram of infant formula. And if we calculate that for the 4 to 7 months old babies and using the body weight of 7 kilograms, we arrive at a melamine intake level of 0.214 milligram per kilogram body weight per day. Now, there is in fact a significant difference in, this, in those two scenarios. And when we look at the intake levels collected uh, for the four to seven months old baby, the difference here was the consumption amount that was collected for country A and for country B. We clearly see that for country B, we have an intake level reached at 0.21. So essentially, we are at or slightly above the tolerable daily intake that was identified by FAO and WHO. And in this particular case, we would consider that the 1 ppm level is not an acceptable uh, cutoff level that would be applied. On the other hand, for country A, uh, the 1 ppm level would be considered as a good enough and protective level. Now, another uh, situation here to highlight the importance of consumption information. Consumption information is also critical in influencing uh, very early on the process of risk analysis. As part of the risk analysis uh, approach, we need to have monitoring data. We need to have monitoring surveys, particularly food monitoring surveys, such as the total diet study, which is known to be the most cost-effective method of obtaining human exposure to contaminants and nutrients. It is a study that uh, looks uh, at the way the population consumes foods and essentially tries to um, represent the foods and, and prepare them in the same way that they are consumed. And in fact, contaminants and nutrients are analyzed in food as consumed. We use the information in order to uh, determine the dietary intakes uh, for uh, contaminants and a number of nutrients. Now, we need to rely on food consumption data if we are to design our sampling plan in order to know what is uh, what are the type of foods that are consumed by the population and how do we categorize 
the food products in such a way that we can design our study. So you see that the influence of consumption studies comes very early on in the process. Uh, and in this particular case, it influences the planning of food monitoring activities. So I hope that through uh, this, uh, uh, this, these two examples, I have highlighted the importance of the investment that, in fact, the Saudi Food and Drug uh, Authority is already doing. Uh, Dr. Salwa Elbar will be uh, presenting later on uh, the efforts that are underway in order to design and implement a uh, food consumption survey in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is critical because this is what will allow you to have a direct estimation of exposure that is reflective of the population, therefore allows to have um, more meaningful and better substantiated risk management decisions, but also it has a number of indirect influences, including the way a certain number of monitoring studies would be designed. Now, this is why uh, this effort that you yourself are already uh, uh, carrying out by investing in food consumption surveys needs to be replicated throughout the world uh, in a manner that will allow to have risk assessments that are reflective of local or national situations in such a way that risk management measures will be commensurate in the, to the level of risk that is observed at those regional levels. Once again, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of the program, and I wish you a great, uh, great continuation of the scientific meeting.